Amen. It's a joy to see everybody this morning. Glad to be with you to celebrate another wonderful Shabbat, uh, which is a unique Shabbat, actually. We will explain in just a moment. I want to welcome uh, our first-time guests who are with us. See a wonderful new faces here again this morning. Such a blessing and honor to have every one of you in the house of Adonai this morning. I want to get right to our lesson um, from Parashah Pinkas. So I want to say our baraka and get right into the teaching so that we um, prayerfully, miraculously, will not run out of time, right? Baruch Hashem, hallelujah. Praise God in heaven. Baruch Hashem. <coughs> if I can turn here, there we go. Where'd my blessing go? I took it out of my Bible. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of Torah. Please, Adonai, our God, sweeten the words of your Torah in our mouth and the mouth of your people, the house of Israel. May we and our offspring and our offspring's offspring and the offspring of your people, the house of Israel, all of us know your name and study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, Adonai who teaches Torah to his people, Yisrael. Amen. Baruch Hashem. So I said that this is a unique Sabbath, and it's, it's interesting that we have uh, the, the, um, the Besor, the gospel reading, being what it is, where we, we find Yeshua uh, in Jerusalem during Pesach, which teaches us a couple of things. When he went to Jerusalem for Passover, which, which is commonly referred to as the Last Supper, what people don't realize, many people don't realize, is that that Last Supper was not just a meal, but it was rather a Pesach Seder. And some people, because, you know, we don't think about it sometimes, so uh, it may not occur to us that Yeshua was alive for some, say, 33 years. We're just going to kind of go with that number. Um, which means that he had 33 Pesach Seders that he attended. Amen. Which also means that there were 33 times in his life in which he went to Jerusalem for Pesach. Right? And I think that's important for us to kind of take a step back and realize because we see sometimes when we read about stories in the Basara, we take them out of context. We think that he went there. This is the one unique time he went for the Last Supper or whatever. This story is not about the Last Supper. It just means he went to Pesach for, I mean, he went to Jerusalem for Pesach. So the sages in talking about, and some of the Hasidic masters in talking about this time period in which we find ourselves, which is the three weeks of uh, mourning. This is the three weeks, the special time in which we remember, not just remember the temple, but we, we pray for the third temple. Most people are, um, who believe in Yeshua, I find that most people are shocked to find out that there's going to be a third temple. I say shocked. I shouldn't, probably shouldn't say that so much because, I, let, me, let me rephrase that. Most people are, are surprised to find out that there will be a third temple and God wants one. What I mean by that is most people think that there's going to be a third temple, but it's going to be because... Um, uh, the anti-Messiah, the Antichrist, as it's called commonly, is going to build it, and it's going to be a, a place of, of uh, deception, and then it'll be destroyed. Then, then Yeshua will come and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, but that's not really accurate, because the Bible actually says that Hashem wants to build the third temple. That is the place from which Mashiach is going to reign. That'll be his HQ, as it were. <laughs> And if you actually read the book of Revelation in chapter 21, it says something that is also written in other Jewish literature, which is that the third temple is going to, what well, it says in, in Revelation 21, that it's going to come down from Shemaim, it's going to come down from heaven. In other Jewish writings like the Talmud and the Midrash, it says something similar, but basically it says the Mashiach is going to build the temple and the temple is going to be supernatural. In other words, the third temple, the third and final temple is going to be the temple, the structure, the tabernacle, if you will, that Moses saw to begin with from which he made the copy. Amen. <laughs> right? So imagine this. When, when, when Moses came down and instructed the people to start making the tabernacle, what they were making was what we call in French Xerox. <laughs> 
And in French we say Zirox. But not really. But he was making a copy of what he had seen in Shemayim. Now that's really exciting. Because what that tells us is the Ark of the Covenant that Indiana Jones found and the menorah and all that other stuff, that there exists all of that in Shemayim. Which means that when, when, when we go, people say when you go to heaven, right? Well, we'll hold that thought. We go to heaven. We're gonna, but the thing is, when we go to heaven, we're going to see the original. Now, here's the other trick. We're not actually going to go to heaven. And this is not some kind of weird theology. But if you get it, Revelation, heaven and earth become one. Because remember what, what, what was God's original plan? God's original plan was that he would create Adam, and Adam was a spiritual being. In fact, you know, the sages write about Adam, and they say that he was, you know, it says, let us make God, let us, excuse me, let us make man in our own image. Um, the sage is saying another, somebody asked me recently, I think it was, uh, you know, it doesn't matter who, but somebody asked me recently, um, what does that mean exactly? Who, to whom was he speaking? And I said, well, you know, if you, if you ask traditional rabbis, they'll say he was talking to the angels or whatever, but, but we, we know that that's not true because who can counsel God but God, right? So in essence, he was talking to himself. But, wait a minute, hold on. There was somebody else there, though. But who was the somebody else? Well, the sage is saying in another place that when God created the world, he looked into the Torah to create it. So if you put those two thoughts together, God said, let us make man in our own image. Who's the us? And over here it says God looked into the Torah to make the world. Okay? That's what the sages say, but it's, the reason they say that is because that's what the Bible says. It says in Proverbs 8, right? So hold on. So we got those two thoughts, right? Now we're going to do some deductive reasoning. Ready? Here we go. I'm going to get to my first point in just a second. So, um, <laughs> so we take those two thoughts. We come back here and we say, okay, so God looked into the Torah. And so there's another Jewish thought that the word anoki, which is another way of saying I in Hebrew, like ani, when we have anoki, that word is actually an acronym that means I wrote myself down in the Torah and gave it to you. Amen. Which means, uh, well, this is getting kind of deep, and I don't mean, I don't, I don't mean to get that deep, really, but uh, what it means that God, God con, con, contracted himself, as, as, as Rabbi Trugman pointed out in his, his book, that God contracted himself in a form in which we could interact with him which was the word of God. So, God said, let us make man in our image. He looked into the Torah and made the world. The Torah is him writing, written down. He talked to Mashiach. Nice. Because John 1 says that the word was made flesh and made his dwelling with. He came and he contracted himself in a form in which we could interact with. Amen. It's like if you had a train set. Anybody have a train set when you're growing up? Anybody had like, you got, you kind of, you were like one of those train set, I, I don't mean this ugly, but you're those train set kind of geeks, you know, there's other geeks too, there's rocket geeks, and there's model geeks, and there's, there's hobby geeks, right? I was a, I was a Civil War geek, okay? So you had the, uh, you had the, uh, um, the, the, the train set, right? So you make this train set, you made it, right? You make all the pieces, but what if you wanted to go in there and interact with everybody? Well, you can't really like sit down in the middle of the train set because you destroy it, right? So what you got to do is you got to make an icon of yourself and, and put it in the village and go, hi. Like, are you the creator? Well, no, but I represent the creator. I'm like an image of him. He's actually over there. <laughs> anyway, right, okay, so going back here. So God made Adam, and Adam looked so much like him that the angels actually, when they saw Adam, they actually fell down to worship him. Wow, wow. And Hashem had to show up and say, hey, that's not me. <laughs> I know, that's a spitting image, I know, but it's not me. This gets, it gets confusing. Can you imagine? The angels who've been around Hashem, and they're like, but, but, I mean, like, what if I see, if I see the man, I've seen the father. So, I mean, 
So they're waiting for the second Adam. So all that to say that going back um, to God's perfect intention, perfect plan, his perfect plan was to bring heaven to earth and to interact with man, with man the, spiritual, the spiritual being, right? So in the end, in the final, in the final, 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 he's going to bring the, the temple here. So we're sell it, we are... Mm, mm, memorializing the destruction of the temple, number one. Number two, we're yearning and praying for the temple to be rebuilt and sooner or later. You know, because what that means is, is that Mashiach will return and we will be able to rule it, or, or yeah, we'll rule and reign with, with Hashem, really. Amen. Not that we lust after rulership. Don't misunderstand that commandment. I mean, that uh, statement. But, you know, we're just want to... I, frankly, I don't care if I'm a doorkeeper. I really don't. I, you just you will find me. You'll probably find me when you get to Shemayim. Look me up. I will be in the environmental services department below the temple, and they're just going to call me on the high holy days to come clean up. And that's what you'd be like. Hey, hey, guys. That's where I'm. I'll be the guy pushing the trash can. That's my role. Okay, and I'm totally cool with that. I'm totally good for that. All right, so. So we, so that's the other thing. So those are the two things. But then the third thing is really, really, really important, and that is during this time we take ownership for our part in destroying the temple, right. metaphorically and literally, because we all play a role in, in in breaking down the temple walls, and we all, and, and the moment in which we say, oh, "I didn't have any part in that," is the moment we are lying to ourselves. And so our role during this period is to put the bricks back where they belong. Amen. Brick by brick, right? Which in part means building ourselves back up, looking at ourselves in the mirror and asking, and, and, and what part did we play and how can we rectify that? And the other part is building each other up. All right, so this is getting back really to what I wanted to say from the beginning, why this Shabbat is special, because... Some of the Hasidic masters teach that because this is such a time of mourning and during the three weeks there are, you know, we, we cut back on our joy in, in, in certain areas and then the final week is even, even more uh, extreme, you might say. Um, there's little things that we do, um, there are customs and so on. But there's three Shabbats during this period too. And so Shabbat is totally different. Shabbat is a unique day. When the scripture says, this is the day the Lord has made, it's really talking about the Sabbath. Okay? That's the day it's talking about. This is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice in it. That is a Shabbat verse. Okay? And so the thing about it is, is that when we, we come out of mourning into the Shabbat, we trans, during this time period, we transition from kind of, everything's kind of, uh, you know, kind of solemn, kind of mournful, you know, we're not playing music during the day, and that's really, really hard for me because I'm the kind of person that likes to listen to some classical in the background while I'm doing whatever I'm doing. And so you come into Shabbat, and all of a sudden there's music, and there's wine, and there's happiness. And so the sages say these three Shabbats are like the three pilgrimage festivals. Wow. So today has the spirit, if you will, of Pesach. Today is a spirit of joy. It's a freedom from bondage. It's a freedom from enslavement. It's a freedom from, from, being, uh, from, from the clutches of Mitzrayim, from the clutches of Egypt. And so here we have in our readings, we, hear, we read about Yeshua, and he's in Jerusalem during Pesach. So here we are talking about Pesach, right? So if we look at Parashah Pincus, if we turn back to the book of, of Numbers, which we say in Hebrew, um, Numbers is Bamid Bar, which means in the wilderness. But we, read, we look at this uh, verse. Actually, let's go back to the, the, the final part of Balak, which is in uh, uh, Numbers 25. Numbers 25 and verse, um, verse 1. Let's just read this story, kind of back up in context, because Parsha Pincus kind of picks up in the middle of the story. So it says, Israel settled in Shittim, and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. All right? So remember that Balak was the king of Moab, and his plan was to curse Israel so that Israel could not become uh, a, a great people and take over his territory. But really, the bigger issue we find out from last week is that Balak was really trying to stop Mashiach. 
Balak represents the first anti-Messiah, really. Maybe not the first, but he's certainly among the, the number of anti-Messiahs. His real goal is to stop the Mashiach. You know, by the way, I talked about what Hashem's uh, original intent was for the earth. Our whole purpose, the reason why we exist, is to get back to Hashem's original intent for the, the quote, religion that Mashiach would establish. That's really why Sar Shalom exists. It's, it, the reason why things are seemingly so unfamiliar to so many people, and we totally understand, totally get that. I mean, it was, it was unfamiliar to a lot of us, too, before it became familiar to us. So, you know, um, you know there's people who skydive, and the first time they skydive, they're scared to death, right? And then, then after they skydive for a while, they enjoy it, right? That will never be me, but there were people that do that, right? Okay? So, <clears throat> any case... Um, we exist to really to bring us back to that original intent that we feel like, our conviction is, that it got lost in translation somewhere down. Uh, we, we kind of know where, but it got lost in translation, and people started, people don't know what they don't know, and so now you have just, it's, everybody's all over the map, and in a lot of ways, our, our conviction is anyway, that what followers of Mashi, Mashi, uh, Mashiach are, are doing, the life that they're living, is, um, it's not, you want to say it's bad or evil or anything like that, it's just, it's just off of what was going on in the first century with the followers of Mashiach, and people just don't know what they don't know. And so our whole mission is to come back and kind of bring, bring it back to the way it was intended, okay? So anyway, they, they go, and um, this guy wants to stop Mashiach from coming. He wants to stop this. Let me tell you something. There, is, there are uh, demons, and yes, demons are real. They do exist, okay? Um, Judaism absolutely believes that. There are evil forces that would love to stop this. And there are evil forces that would love to stop Mashiach. Like I told you last week, uh, the devil doesn't really care if you believe. What he really cares about is if you actually do act upon that belief. That's where it becomes a problem, right? All right, so um, Israel became attached to Baal Peor, which is a, a, an idol, and the wrath of Hashem flared up against Israel. Why do they come attached? Balak, the, the whole cursing thing didn't work. So, you know, it doesn't make much sense. If you, if you bring in, you hire a prophet, you know, you go to prophets.com and you hire somebody. <laughs> he comes in and every, he tries to say a curse, but out of his mouth comes a blessing. You would think you'd just stop right there and give up, right? But sometimes we get into delusion. We get into delusion, and so he's in delusion, so he figures he can't get us by cursing us, so he will send uh, wicked women to us, right? Okay, that's what happens, and so we fall forward, and we start worshiping the idol. So the wrath of Hashem flared up against Israel, and Adonai said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people, hang them before Hashem against the sun, and the flaring wrath of Hashem will withdraw from Israel. Moses said to the judges of Israel, Let each man kill his men who were attached to Baal Peor. Behold, a man of the children of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman near to his brothers in the sight of Moses and the sight of the entire assembly of Israel, and they were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Why did this, turns out this, uh, this uh, leader, this prince, why did he do this? Because Cosby came to him, who's the princess of Moab, and said, hey, I'm a princess. Uh, I'm, I'm basically, I'm paraphrasing the story, I'm here to seduce Israel. Um, but I, I can only be with a leader. So I need like Moses or Aaron. So this guy, Zimri, says, huh, I'm kind of a big deal around here. I'm as, a, as, as much a big deal as Moses and Aaron. In fact, let me prove it to you. I'm going to walk you, I'm going to take you by the hand, and we're going to walk by Moses and the elders. And so I'm going to do this thing in broadness in front of them. And, and basically, it was, this is like a snub, like, hey, I'm, I've, I'm just as good as you guys are, right? So that was his motive. So Phineas, son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the Cohen. Now keep in mind, it's already told us who Phineas is, right? Okay, bear that in mind. Phineas, son of Eliezer, son of Aaron the Cohen, saw and stood up from amid the assembly and took a spear in his hand. He followed the Israelite man into the tent and pierced them both through. The Israelite man and the, and the woman pierced them in their stomach. And the plague was halted from upon the children of Israel. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. Now, this rolls into our parasha today, which begins in Numbers 25 and verse 10. Adonai spoke to Moses saying, Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the Cohen. Notice it gives us his genealogy again. 
That's really important. You know, this is the beautiful thing about studying um, the scriptures from a Jewish perspective, which includes looking at Jewish writings, because way back in ancient times, these rabbis who wrote, and understand that a lot of the rabbis who commented on the scripture, some of them who comment, um, or at least we hear their, their insights, some of them were, were there. Think about that. Let me ask you a question. If, if I was a historian and I had a, I had a PhD in history and my, my emphasis in that PhD was on World War II history, right? Suppose that was my, that was my, I was, I'm an expert. I've, I've been, I've been, I went to, uh, I went to Harvard <laughs> and I studied, did I do that right, Zach and Rayford? Harvard? Did I, okay. I did, the, I studied, <laughs> he's from Boston. So yeah. I studied, I got a PhD and I've, you know, I've been to Europe, to the different battlefields and so on. I'm giving a lecture on the Battle of the Bulge. And in walks a captain, with, maybe with a cane because he's kind of old now. And he was with a rifle company in Patton's army, 3rd Army, at the Battle of the Bulge. I'm going to ask you a question. To whom would you listen to more? Me or the man who actually was there with a rifle in his hand fighting the battle? And to what one of you, when he said, well... This is what happened at this particular time. What one of you would raise your hand and say, I'm sorry, I did, that wasn't written in the history book. I'm going to need you to prove that to me. Right? That's Jewish literature. Okay, so Hashem spoke to Moses saying, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the Kohen, turned back my wrath from upon the children of Israel. When he zealously avenged my vengeance upon them, so I did not consume the children of Israel in my vengeance. Therefore, say, behold, I give him my covenant of shalom. Now, the rabbis point out there's a reason why he points to his genealogy twice, and they pick up on it because they're just astute like that. Not a whole lot passes them by. Also in the Torah scroll, the word shalom is always written with a broken vav in the Torah scroll. So they also wonder about that because a lot of these things have been done since Sinai, and many people have wondered, I wonder why of all the times that Shalom is written, why is it written with a, the letter Vav? It's a Hebrew letter. It looks like a line. And it's broken in half. What is that about? What is that supposed to indicate? All right. So let's take a lesson from this, this story. So we hear about this story about Phineas. He sees what's going on with this Moab woman and this leader of Israel he takes her in front of Moses and all the elders and he observes that the elders are stunned. They're weeping. Maybe they don't know what to do. This is shocking. I can relate to that. Sometimes we just see things we can't believe. Are you serious? Is this happening? So what does is, what is Phineas do, he takes his spear and he rushes out and he's going to slay these two and he's going to solve the problem. He is a zealot. But in this story, we're going to prayerfully glean some life lessons on how we can be good leaders. And we're going to do a little bit of Tevia from, from Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> we're, going to do, we're going to do a little bit of on the one hand, but on the other hand, Okay, it's going to be a lot like that, right? Because on the one hand, we're excited about Phineas. We're excited about his zealotry. Uh, we also, uh, the sages say that uh, there's, well, I should say in the Talmud it relates that Phineas and, El and, and Elijah are the same person. Now, um, I'm not saying that's not true. I just, it's, just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thought that, that's out there and it's based on scriptural text. It's not based on just craziness. There's actually a reason why that is said. Um, but we look at Elijah and we see his actions when he was confronting the prophets of Baal, which here we have Phineas confronting Baal, right? Baal and Baal. So we'll get to this in a second. But, but on the one hand, we can look at both those situations and go, man, that's, that is great zeal for God. Man, I, I wish I could be like Phineas. On the other hand, 
God does not want zealots. But on the other hand, it's good to have zeal for God and to be a true zealot. And who wouldn't want to have their name inscribed next to Phineas as one of the people who stood up for God and, and really, really made a difference. But on the other hand, in order to be a true zealot, there's a very critical and frankly difficult attribute to attain. And so one of the comments that is, was written down about this was from a contemporary rabbi who said, the true zealot is an utterly selfless individual. One who is concerned only about the relationship between God and his people with no thought, no thought for his own feelings on the matter. The moment his personal prejudice and inclinations are involved, he ceases to be a true zealot. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that would exclude virtually every one of us in this room. Because if you think about it, the street preacher that goes out, see, unless that person can actually say in their soul, that they have no personal prejudice. There's no, there's nothing. They're completely pure. Their, their act that they're doing is completely selfless. There's no anger. There's no rage. There's no indignation. They're just out there only for the sake of the name of God. And the problem is, is their actions, their zealous actions of preaching out loud. I'm not talking about the person who goes out and talks to people. I'm talking about the person who was on the, on the corner on this proverbial soapbox preaching with a bullhorn or whatever. That is not bringing glory to God. That's really only bringing glory to self. And that's the hard lesson because we all want to be zealous. And on one hand, zealotry is good. But on the other hand, we have to understand that in order to be a true zealot, we have to have our motives pure. This is why the zealots in the temple age were one of the worst sects of Jews because when they went to war against Rome, it was really a power struggle. They were just mad at Rome. And when other Jews said, hey, we don't want to participate. We're not saying we like Rome. We're just saying that we think this is a bad idea. And so we would like to leave the city and just say, we're not going to fight they would kill them. And the zealots are, I'll put it out this, if you listen, look at the history, the zealots are responsible for as many murders as the Romans were responsible for. And, and so there you go. We talk about Masada, which is uh, in Israel. If you know the story of Masada, we look at that as a courageous act, but in reality, Judaism forbids um, uh, suicide. So now you had leaders that, that encouraged the entire population of Masada to kill themselves and understand why they were there to begin with. I know, I know I'm kind of, you know, it's, it's not really the Alamo. You know, it's, it's, it's you got people up there. The reason they're there is because it, this all started with selfish ambition. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, I, I, I hear what I'm saying. I just, we have to be honest about our motivations is the point. I'm not bashing the people of Masada and those kinds of things. I'm just simply saying we have to really stop and go, wait, why, why are we, we going to kill ourselves now? Why are we here? What was all this really about? What, what was all this really about? Right? And we have to take a step back and check our motives. That's really what, this, what I'm talking about. So the first, the first point of this whole episode of, of, of learning about the life of Phineas, because it turns out Phineas, his motivation was pure, it turns out. Turns out that he, he did everything right. So on the one hand, he was a true zealot, but on the other hand, he wasn't God's chosen leader because of this. God's chosen leadership fell to Yehoshua, a.k.a. Yeshua, a.k.a. Joshua. And there's a reason why. It's really for the same reason that God's leadership for building the temple fell to Solomon and not David. So the number one prerequisite for being a true zealot, for being a true leader, really, for for being someone who's, who's, who's going to lead people into truth, because we, all, we say that. That's like the zealot. I want to lead people in truth, right? So the number one prerequisite is compassion and love. Compassion and love. If you don't really have true compassion for people, 
And true love for people, you'll never be able to lead them in truth. You'll just be a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. You will be somebody that they, they will grow to loathe. And as a matter of fact, the message you're trying to t- teach them will be the very message they will reject. All because you lack compassion and love. All because I lack compassion and love. We have to look ourselves in the proverbial mirror and say, do I have true compassion and true love? Do I weep? And, and I'm speaking to the gentleman, do we weep? And if we're not weeping, then we need to pray for tears. You know, Ahmed, I, I, I marvel at Ahmed's prayer that he prays because it's, it's, it's very, every week it's somewhat different, but it's generally the theme is the same. And that is praying for people, praying for workers, praying for the harvest. And I wonder, I ask myself this question. I'm just, just, it's just, it's just we're just talking here this morning. Do I pray that during the week? Do I really pray for people? Do I have compassion for people? Do I want them to see them really set free? Because I said to you a while ago that our whole point here is to bring people into this freedom. We're talking about today is like the spirit of, of, of Pesach. This, this walk is a walk of liberty. Yes. Yes. Torah, a Torah true life is the freest life you will ever live. Amen. It's so freeing. There's a reason why people are following over themselves trying to get into this country. There's a reason why people are flogging here. And it's not because America is terrible. It's not because, you know, America, the fly the flag upside down, we've got a problem. <laughs> Come on. There's plenty of people who, who, uh, who, who, who dislike this president. There was plenty of people who disliked the last president. There were some who disliked the president before that, right? So, uh, you know, it's, it's newsflash. Not everybody likes a president who's sitting in office all the time. Um, so... But even, you know, people say, this country's a mess. There's some people, you know, who are out there rioting, and the president stinks and all this kind of stuff. Then why are people still trying to get here right. if it's so bad? Right. One of the reasons why this country is so great and the people are trying to get here, and unfortunately, some of them try to come in illegally, and, you know, it's, you know, sorry, you know, but here's the problem with that. The reason they're trying to get here, and this is the irony of it, they're trying to break the law to get here, and I understand why, but, you know, it's not okay. They're trying to do that, and here's the problem with it. Hold on. They're very, nine times out of ten, they're leaving a lawless society where they have no freedom and no protection to come into a law society, but in doing that, they're trying to break the law to do it. And that's the problem. We as believers in this, in this, t- taking that analogy to a spiritual level, a lot of times we want the freedom that the law gives, but we want to break the law in order to get that freedom that the law gives. And we don't understand because we've been so deluded in our thinking that, to, to believe that lawlessness is freedom. Let me do whatever I want and, and say whatever I want and eat whatever I want and live however I want and be with whoever I want, no matter what sex they are. Use whatever bathroom I want to I I bu- use. And we find out that, in fact, that is not freedom. That is bondage. Yeah. You know, my wife, the Rebbit scene, was reading an article this week, or maybe she watched the story, I don't know, but she was telling me about it, that there was a man who had um, grown up believing that he was a woman, right? Ladies and gentlemen, with, with all the compassion in the world, I just want to tell you, that is a mental disorder. That's all it is. God is... God knows what he's doing when he puts a soul into a body and he does not make a mistake and put a female soul into a male body. God makes no mistakes, period, okay? It's a mental disorder. Later in the article, this man it says exactly that. He came to find out that he had a mental disorder. But he had had the surgery and all this kind of stuff, but it didn't make him happy. So he ended up jumping off of the, of the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a 75-foot dro- drop. My wife was relaying the story to me, and I'm like, wow. And he said that 1% of the people survived that fall, okay? He, just through a series of circumstances, Coast Guard happened to be just hanging out that day right there. He, 
he hit the water like the exact position you're supposed to. I guess maybe he did like we did used to do. You know, I don't know. How he hit it like you're supposed to, you know. And um, it says that when he when his hands let go of the rail to to to, to fall, that very instant he regretted it. That very instant. And he later talked to other survivors, the very few, who not only jumped off the bridge, but others who've also killed themselves and failed, or tried to kill themselves, you're saying failed. <laughs> That's awkward. But they all said the same thing. They all regretted it. The, in, the very instant that they did whatever they did, they, they regret it. Okay? So... For us, it teaches us a very valuable lesson that, 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 that life is precious and that we have to understand that sometimes we make choices and we have to understand that some of those choices are fine on our lives. But God wants us to live. He wants us to have freedom. He wants us to have everything he has in store for us. And that's why you're here. I always say, if you're a first-time guest, you know, you're not here by accident. You're here because Hashem wanted you to be here. So there's a story that this actually comes from the, the Talmud and the tractate Avodah Zarah 18a. There's a story that goes like this. It says, Rabbi Yose ben Kisma fell ill. Rabbi Hanina ben Teradion went to visit him. Rabbi Yose said to him, Hanina, my brother, do you not know that this nation, that is the Romans, have been granted kingship by heaven? Wow. And it has destroyed, they have destroyed the, the base of Midash, the temple, burned the sanctuary, killed all the pious people. They've eradicated the best of his servants, and, and it, yet the, the Rome still stands. And I've heard that you sit and toil in Torah in public places. The problem is the Romans have forbade it. And he says, you even gather people to hear your Torah lessons, holding a Sefer Torah in your lap, thus violating a Roman decree against Torah study. The heavens will have mercy, answers Rabbi Hanina. I offer you words of wisdom and you can only respond, the heavens will have mercy, asked Rabbi Yose. I would be surprised if they do not burn you with the Torah scroll. All right? Now keep, keep in mind. On the one hand, he's defying Rome and said, I'll teach the Torah no matter what. With, well, I've got the big Torah scroll in my lap and I'm going to teach Torah. I'm going to teach Torah. I don't care if you kill me or not. On the other hand, why are you risking your life unnecessarily? Because in Judaism, there's a life before law principle. Remember that. Some people say that, that Judaism is legalistic. It absolutely is not. There's a story about a rabbi, one of the, I forget, it was in uh, Eastern Europe during the 1800s. It was on Yom Kippur. And there was a woman who had recently given birth. And in that part of Europe, Yom Kippur could be cold. In this, in this case, it was cold. She had recently given birth. And so everybody, everybody's in the synagogue and it's Yom Kippur. Okay? This is serious. This, was, this is when everybody shows up, even if they're not religious, they show up, right. right? So somebody comes in and they happen to mention to the rabbi about the woman who's just given birth and she's at her cabin. So everybody's davening, going through all the prayers, right? Very important. It's very important. All of a sudden, rabbi disappears. What's going on? On Yom Kippur, you can't eat, you can't do any work. I mean, it's like, it's like, it's, it's really the only commanded fast, really. Yeah. It's the fast of all fasts. It even trumps Shabbat. So some of his Talmudim decide, what happened to the Rebbe? So they, through a series of circumstances, they find out that he had ventured off towards this cabin. So they go there, and what do they find? They find his, his special coat folded up and put on a pile of logs. He's got his sleeves rolled up, and he's axing, with an axe, he's cutting Wood, chopping wood. <laughs> Rebbe, what are you doing? It's Yom Kippur. What are you doing? And he said, 
There was a woman in there with a brand new baby. It's cold out here. She could die if it's not warm in her cabin. So I'm cutting wood and making a fire for her. Why? Because life before law. Okay? So this man doesn't have to give up his life to do what he's doing. So what's the deal, right? So on the one hand, he could be a great Zodiac. On the other hand, we don't know. So his friend is trying to find out because this is what friends do, okay? So Rabbi Yossi says, will I merit the life in the world to come? Asked Rabbi Hanina. Or he, I'm sorry, he asked Rabbi Yossi, will I merit the life in the world to come? And Rabbi Yossi said, hmm, did you do any good deeds? Follow this story. Hold on now. Some of you are like, I knew Jews work for their salvation. No, they don't. <laughs> a rabbi's question always has a motive behind it, right? So he's like, do you do any good deeds? Well, he says, money I set aside for pouring meals was mingled with tzedakah money, and I, and, and I distributed all of it to the poor, said Rabbi Hanina. If so, if so, may my portion be as yours, said Rabbi Yose. In other words, if that's true, then you will have a portion in the world to come. What was he trying to say? What's important about that story? So here is this man who loves Hashem and is willing even to risk his life to teach Torah, to be zealous to teach Torah to the world. He's even willing to suffer burning at the stake at the hands of the Romans. So his friend says, when he asks his friend, do you think, I'm, I'm, I think, kind of feel like I'm dying. You think I'll go to Shemaim? And his friend says, I don't know. Have you done anything good? And his response was, I've given Sadaka to feed the poor. And his friend says, well, if that's the case, then may my portion be like yours. What was the message? I see that you really do have compassion and love for people and that your good deeds are not based on any self aggrandizement or any kind of other motivation, but it's because you truly love people. Otherwise, you wouldn't give your money away. Because Yeshua said, if your eye is dark, that is, if you're greedy, then your whole body is dark. But if you're a generous person, then you have light. And so, speaking of that, we have the rich young ruler story from Matthew 19, 16 through 23. Now behold, one, one came to him and said, Teacher, what good, please listen, what good shall I do to have eternal life? This is the Christian pastor's dream. <laughs> to have somebody walk up and say, What must I do to inherit eternal life? That is a dream come true. But the answer is, is 180 degrees opposite of what anybody would say today. This is what Yeshua, the Mashiach, said. Why do you ask me about what is good? Yeshua said to him, there is only one who is good. But if you want to enter into life, here comes the Roman road. <laughs> wow. Listen. Listen. Keep the commandments. What? <laughs> this is, I want to remind you who's saying this. This is the Messiah. This is the one who walked out of the tomb. This is the one that when the guards were staying there and they said, we're looking for Yeshua, and he said, I am, they all fell on their face. Okay. He's the one who's answering the question from the person who walked up and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, follow the commandments. Now, listen to the rest of the story. Because he, the guy says, which ones? That's always a problem, right? <laughs> Come on now. Quit pretending like we're not the rich young ruler, okay? All of us read this story and go, yeah, I can't believe he asked that. Are you kidding me? You asked that question. All the time. He's on a horse. Which one? Nice. Right? You've got to follow the commands of God. And we always ask God, which one? The kosher one? Don't say yes. <laughs> which one? I've got to give up whatever. Don't say that. Right. Which one? I've got to, I can't go to the mall on Sabbath. Oh, my God. <laughs> the good news is it's open on Sunday, okay? So don't worry about it. <laughs> I mean, right? That's, we all do God that way. We always ask God, which one? As if he wrote all these down and he wanted us to pick. Right? That's what it, that was his goal. Okay? 
So he says, which one? And Yeshua said, do, you know, so Yeshua's playing along. Yeah. Yeshua says, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. And the guy says, all these have kept. I'm not sure I would say that. <laughs> all these I have kept. The young man said to him, what do I still lack? Now listen to Yeshua's response and remember what Rabbi Yose had asked Rabbi Hanina. He said, if you want to be perfect, perfect, say perfect. perfect. If you want to be perfect, go and sell what you own and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he had much property. Then Yeshua said to his disciples, Amen, I, I, may, amen, I tell you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. This is not about money. What he really wanted to know from the young man is, do you have love and compassion for people? Because I'm convinced, I don't know if I'm right, I'm convinced if the man had said absolutely and he headed off to do it, Yeshua would have said, stop, 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 come back, come back, come back. You don't have to sell everything. Because by the way, that's not Torah. Selling all your goods is not Torah. <laughs> right. you, don't, you don't have to do that. But make sure you give sadaka. Make sure you give the tithe. In fact, if you haven't been doing so, you make shuva. You go, do what, you go make up what you haven't been giving. Mm-hmm. But I needed to check and make sure you had love and compassion. Because it's really, that's a prerequisite. For without, without love of God and love of man, there's no entering into heaven. And that's what his whole message was about. It doesn't mean you don't have to keep the commandments. Of course you keep the commandments. I mean, that goes without saying. But if you're doing all that without love and compassion, you have nothing. All right, our next point. We read this morning, I won't, for the sake of time, I won't read it again, but we read this morning from John chapter 2 that Yeshua walks into the, walks into the temple and pulls a Phineas. By the way, there's actually a religious law in Judaism that a zealot does not ask permission of the court to do what he's about to do. Yeah, because if he walks into the court and says, may I have permission to be a zealot? He is exhibiting concern for his own, be- for his own self. And therefore, they will deny him. This is actually a Jewish law. They will deny him because they said, you're not a true zealot. This is the very fact that you asked. Because zealotry acts Without any consideration, I don't care if I die, I don't care what happens, I'm only acting for the sake of Hashem's name. And Yeshua's anger was not directed at any particular individual. He, was, it was, his, he stated what his purpose was. My Father's house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And you've made it into a den of robbers. Understand, by the way, because people, people might say, well, the Jews were doing that. Understand that at that time in history, the temple area and all the priesthood was under the control of Rome. Mm-hmm. And the priesthood was all about money making. Mm-hmm. They, that's what they bought and paid for their seat. So don't, don't implicate Jews and all that. I'm not saying there weren't Jews involved. There's always bad apples in every crowd. But we can't make a blanket statement and say that Jews were money hungry. That's not true. Right? So, so the question becomes... <clears throat> what, what, was the, what was Yeshua's motive? He says that I have zeal for your house. That comes from Psalm, Psalm 69, 10. The zeal for your house consumes me. This is actually a statement from King David. So we take this back to Phineas. The Israelites had a complaint against Phineas. Their complaint was, and this is according to Rashi on Bamidbar 25, uh, 11. In fact, let me just turn here. If you have the Rashi commentary, what I'm about to read you is on page 320. That's the beautiful part about us all having the same stuff. <clears throat> page 320. So anyway, Rashi comments and says, Phineas, son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the Cohen, that, that they were, people were asking, they were humiliating him, they were making fun of him, saying that, did you see this son of Puti?" whose mother's father fattened calves for idolatry, yet he killed a prince of Israel? This is why the scripture writes Rashi comes to trace his ancestry to Aaron. So the question was earlier, why is his lineage mentioned twice? And the answer is to vindicate him from the slanderers. Because what the people were saying was, 
Because, see, they didn't act. And we, all, we would like to think that when people do the right thing, we'd like to think, well, I would have done that. But they didn't act, right? And so they were trying to find an excuse for themselves not acting like a zealot properly. But the, here's the problem. And them trying to find an excuse for themselves, they were trying to tear Phineas down. Oh. And they said that, listen, he, 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 his, his father, his grandfather used to fatten calves for idolatry. What, what was that about? Well, they considered it an act of cruelty to prepare an animal only to be sacrificed. Right? Especially to idols. So they were making fun of, of him and they were disparaging him, but God had said that he was a righteous man and he did this for his own sake, but they were saying, no, he did this because he's a cruel person. In other words, he's not a true zealot because in his heart of hearts, he was mad, and that level of anger and hatred was disqualified him from being a zealot, and he got that anger and hatred because his, his descendant, or he's descended from, rather, an idolater. And it turns out that his father, Eliezer, had married one of Jethro's daughters. Remember Moses married Zipporah? Well, here's the thing, though. This is the other sadistic part of this. Jethro had already converted to Judaism, and he was no longer an idolater. But the people were not accepting him, which is also a big no-no in Judaism. So he wasn't an idolater, and neither were his daughters. But they were saying, oh, you know, they were bringing up his past, right? You know, like the old thing we used to say back in the day, when the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> the real charge against him was he was doing this out of anger. So in all of this, by the way, was Israel's defense of themselves. And this is one of the problems we have when we see people doing good and we're like, oh, they're doing that just for this reason or that reason. We've got to be really careful about that because a lot of times we're just trying to make excuses for why we're not doing it. Right? They're just doing that because they're trying to be legalistic. Right? You know, early, early on in this walk, my wife and I were in Israel and we were with a Messianic couple. And this was way back in the day. I mean, this is a long time ago. And, and we, we were still greenhorns and didn't know a whole lot. And, you know, Hashem has just been gracious with us. And so we're standing in a shopping mall in Israel, in, in Haifa. And this lady's with us and she belongs to this Messianic community church big, big one that is supposed to want to reach Jews, right? Right? Okay. So, um, so this lady walks by, and she's Jewish. She walks by, and she's got a tekel on her head. And the lady turns to my wife and says, this lady who observes her, and says, she's just, look at that, so self-righteous, just wearing that just to be seen. Yeah, what she say? She thinks, she thinks she's spiritual. Well, first of all, if you're in a country to reach people, you should love them. Right. <laughs> okay? But how does she know? She's judging that woman. She has no idea. Maybe there are women who wear tackles and they're, they're doing it for the wrong reasons. But we're going to get to that in a second. But because but the wrong reason actually is a good reason because even though it's the wrong reason, it'll become a good reason later. <laughs> But, but how does she know, right? I'm, 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 I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying. Don't, don't, don't go to sleep on me. So the, the fact of the matter is, is that Pincus was actually a true, a true zealot. They were just trying to make themselves feel better by making him sound like he was just being zealous. But the fact of the matter is that the, the Torah says, in essence, according to the Rambel, that Pincus was himself a Sar Shalom. Nice. Which means Prince of Peace. He was, 
a prince of peace. And, and the reason I say this is because the sages say the reason the Torah links him not just to Eliezer but to Aaron is because the Torah is making an emphatic statement. He is a son of Aaron. And the, the, the Torah teaches that Aaron was somebody who pursued peace and he made peace. And, and Aaron's heartbeat was to find people who were quarreling and somehow help them bury the hatchet. And so this is a statement saying, nope, 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 nope. He's not cruel. Nope, this wasn't self-motivation. This was Phineas, who is a son, a.k.a. a disciple of the man who is the illustration of peace. So our lesson to us is the second point, we need to judge favorably. We need to judge favorably because as I said, more often than not, we are judging people. And let's go back to the, to the lady who was wearing the tekel. Let's just suppose, we have no idea, we're just, uh, we have no idea, but let's just suppose that she was doing that because she was just trying to be fashionable and appear spiritual, but she wasn't doing it from a pure motivation. We're going to judge her ill and say that that's what was going on, which by the way, when we judge unfavorable like that, guess what happens? We get judged unfavorably. So Messiah is, talk, is, is approached in Mark chapter 9, and verse 38 through 40. John said to him, Rabbi, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. He was in it for the money. He was in it for the fame. He doesn't really do it. He's not really working. Look at how hard we're working here, and he's doing nothing. He's just out there, and the people are coming to him for counseling. He's rebuking them in your name, and we want it stopped, and we want it stopped right now because it's all a show. First of all, how do they know? Okay. Secondly, Yeshua says, Yeshua responded, says, don't stop him. No one who does a miracle in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil about me. He who is not against us is for us. The sages would say that one mitzvah leads to another. You cannot do a commandment of God, even if you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And it not affect your life. You know why? Because the commandment is spiritual. The Apostle Paul even, even said in his writing, he said, the, the commandment is holy, righteous, and good, and spiritual. So if you're doing something, you're like, well, I'm just doing this because, you know, I want to appear whatever. The sages say, don't stop that person because even though they're doing it with the wrong motive, there will come a point at which it will become the right motive. Yes. As long as they're doing this, they're not against this. They're not against us, they're for us. The Apostle Shaul in his letter to the Philippians kind of says a similar thing that we read in Jewish literature. Interestingly, he says, Some are proclaiming the Messiah out of envy and strife, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the good news. The former proclaim Messiah not sincerely, but out of selflessness, expecting to stir up trouble for me in my imprisonment. But what does it matter? Only that, is in every, in, only that in every way, whether in dishonesty or in truth, Messiah is being proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I will keep rejoicing. Now, obviously, we want everyone to be following the commandments out of sincerity. And that, is, of course, is what we encourage people to do. The point is, judge favorably. Because you don't know what's going on in that person's life and you don't know how Hashem is using them. Suppose somebody, suppose you walk into somebody's house and there's a lady, she lights the Sabbath lights, uh, the Sabbath candles on Friday night and she goes right to the oven or the stove and starts cooking up a meal and she's got, she's got uh, TV going. <laughs> now, many of us, you know, be, we'd be like, hi, hi, hoo, <laughs> Kind of, can I help you turn that off? You know, we say, we, we, say, we say things, right? Or my personal favorite is they light the candles. You're at their house. You're over there, and they set a food down in front of you, and you say, is that kosher? <laughs> oh, that's lovely. No, look, so if, you, if you were concerned, you don't, don't show up. Right? So here's the point. But, but see, we don't know. The lady who's cooking, she just lights the candles. You, we need to be going, praise God in heaven. Why? Because those candle lightings will lead to something else. Yes, yes. This is why I said last week, we don't need to be halakha police. We need to be thanking God everybody does a mitzvah. Every time somebody does a mitzvah, they've just picked up a gold coin. And we need to be running around going, they found it, they found it, they found it, they found it, they found it. <laughs> and we, 
We need to rejoice and say, if they found that one, they're going to start looking for another one. Yes. Yes. This is what's so awesome about it. But instead, we're like, oh, they only picked up one coin. I picked up seven. <laughs> and, yet, and, and Yeshua shows up and says, and I'll take six back. Thank you very much. And give them to the one here. Right? So I'm just saying, love and compassion. Our third point, we got to close, okay? <laughs> Zeal, not anger. I wish I had time to go into all this, but I don't. Zeal, not anger. You know, Rabbi Nakshoni talks about this, that even though, on the one hand, Phineas is a great Zodic, and what he did was A-OK -okay in the USA, and everything was wonderful, and on the other hand, God chose Joshua. It's not, it's not a slam against Phineas. It's just that God is making a point that, listen, if I'm going to pick the leader, I want it to be the guy who is somebody who is calm, cool, collective, and lets things roll off. This is why he picks, he said David. David was a man after God's own heart. That's David's name in the Indian language. I know, I know Indian. It's French, French, French Indian War. So here's the deal. Even though he was a man after God's own heart, he says, I can't let you build my house. I've got to let your, your son Shlomo do it, which means his name means peace. Yeah. Because my, my house needs to be known as a house of peace. And unfortunately, David, not that you, what you did was wrong. I mean, you asked me and I said, do it. But here's the problem. You're associated with war, which is why the first Mashiach had to die because he came to slay the enemy. He had to die and be resurrected of man of peace who's going to come and bring peace to the earth. That's why he can't bring peace initially because he came to war. Yeah, yeah. So he has to be resurrected, wow. the king who brings shalom to the earth. So we've got to lay down. By the way, zeal, if you want to be a real zealot, we go back to the first point. The word zeal itself means jealousy, that is ardent love. And the first place in which it is used is in Numbers 5.14, where it's talking about the sota. In other words, it's the husband's ardent love and jealousy for his wife that brings her into question. So unless you ardently love people and are jealous for their sakes, then don't be a zealot. And remember this, final thing. We're going to ask our Zakin to come and give our announcements. But one final thing. God did not smite Egypt because he hated Egypt. Or he hated Egyptians. God smote Egypt because he was jealous and loved Israel so much. And the only reason there was more than one, the only reason there was the first plague was because Pharaoh wouldn't let him go. And he's like, hey, let my wife go. <laughs> he wouldn't let him go. Let him go. <laughs> That's it. It wasn't because he hated him. Right. So we need to just remember that, that the lesson from Finnis' life is it's good to be zealous, but we can be zealous only if we have love and compassion and we have rid ourselves of anger and hate. Amen. But what do we know? What do we know? Ruka Shepherd.